Okay, now we're going to pick up the conversation we started yesterday, so it's a, a sobering note. Um, I think it was established yesterday. We kill billions of animals a year. Uh, and uh, research seems to indicate that about 97% of us eat meat. And yet, more people report loving their pets than loving their spouse. <laughs> it's true. And, uh, and the uh, North American, only the North American spend on pets uh, this last year was $70 billion. So um, the title of our next speaker's book is Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat. <laughs> Why it's so hard to think straight about animals. Um, the cow is sacred in some parts of the world, the pig is abominable. Nobody in our culture would dream of eating a dog or a horse. Uh, Muslims won't touch pork. Um, Hindus won't touch beef. It's all very complicated, and that's why we've invited Hal Herzog here to help answer the question, why humans have pets and chimps don't. Hal. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. By the way, I feel like I'm uh, following the Rolling Stones here. It's a great way to wake up in the morning. How many of you live with an animal, that you have an animal in your life that you deeply love? Okay, if you're a dog owner, let's get a count. Say, woof, woof. <laughs> Cat owner, say, meow. <laughs> All right. So you know how deep our relationships can go. For example, 95% of Canadian, Canadian pet owners think of their animals as members of the family. Um, I hate to say this, but in the United States, a recent study found that about 40% of married women said that they got more emotional support from their dog than they did their husband <laughs> or their kids. And more than half of Americans say that they would not sell their pet for a million dollars. And I want to say, I am not in that category. And <laughs> this is my cat, Tilly. She's a real sweetheart. I will sell her for a million dollars, even Canadian dollars. So if you're interested, <laughs> See me later, okay? Now, what I want to do is argue that humans are the only animals to keep pets. And I want to, first of all, talk about the exception that proves the rule. And it's absolutely fascinating. A group of uh, primatologists in Brazil in 2004 discovered a group of capuchin monkeys that are about this big and very smart living, having adopted a marmoset, a baby marmoset, another species, another genera of monkeys, which is about this big. They named, the primatologist named her Fortunata, the fortunate one. And the neat thing about this was that they basically treated her like one of their kids. The, the, uh, the capuchins fed Fortunata. They protected her from harm. They carried her around. She lived with them. And this relationship went on for 14 months, at which point Fortunata's luck ran out for no one, reasons no one knows, and she suddenly disappeared. Well, I'm going to argue that Fortunata is the exception that proves the rule. And the rule is that humans are the only animals to keep pets. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, no, he's completely wrong. What about Coco's kitten? What about these other cases of animal odd couples, which we find so fascinating? You know, a uh, giant tortoise that falls in love with the hippopotamus, a deer and a, and a, and a, and a bunny, a chimpanzee and a, and a tiger. And we love these things because, in a way, they're sort of moral models. After all, if a chimpanzee and a baby tiger can get along, why can't Arabs and Israelis get along? But the fact is that all these situations involve human interference. They occur in homes. They occur in zoological parks. They occur in wildlife parks. For example, I have met that chimpanzee. In fact, that's a picture of me with her. And I've got to say, there's nothing in this world like having a baby chimpanzee jump into your arms and looking into your eyes. That is a deep, deep pleasure that I've experienced that most people won't be able to. Um, but my argument is that animals could keep pets in the wild, but they don't because they don't want to. And the question is, and the question is, oh, this thing is not working right. Can I get another click? Oh, uh, there we go. Why don't animals in nature keep pets? For example, chimpanzees share food, they have long parental care, but they don't seem to want to keep pets, and, chimp and other animals do. Whoops. Do you have another clicker? So this is an evolutionary mystery. Why should we invest in animals that we have no, share no genes with, and that come at some cost? So for example, 
you may not know it, you may not realize, but that dog or cat that you're living with over the, over the lifetime of that animal is going to cost you about $10,000. Then there's the problem of living with predators. And, for example, in North America, birds kill, I mean, excuse me, cats, the cats that we live with kill between a billion and five billion birds each year. And dogs also evolved from predators, the wolf. And in the United States, five million pe people are seriously bitten by dogs each year. And last year was typical. 34 Americans were killed by dogs. 14 of them were children. So there's a cost that comes to living with the pet. And evolutionary psychologists have developed some theories to explain why this is the case. And the first of these evolutionary theories is that we fall in love with pets because they remind us of our own children. And this is exemplified by this woman in, in uh, Amazonia who's feeding a, her child on one breast and she's feeding a, a monkey on the other breast, her pressed monkey on the other breast. And so we tend to fall for animals that have big eyes and cute features that remind us of, that remind us of human infants. Another theory of why we keep pets is that pets may increase our reproductive fitness. And this is the idea of perhaps they evolve through sexual selection. So a group of French uh, social psychologists did an experiment in which they recruited this handsome young Frenchman named Antoine to approach women in a Parisian mall, walk up to them and say, hi, my name is Antoine, uh, I find you attractive, I've got to go to work this afternoon. However, um, if you give me your phone number, I, maybe I could give you a call later and we could go out and have a drink. And the deal was that in half of these approaches, in half the cases, he was by himself, and the other half, he was with this cute little dog that was uh, the dog of one of the researchers. The dog's name was Gwindu, which the dog's nickname was Dudu, which unfortunately does not translate very well into English. And the question they were interested in was, did, when, were women more likely to give their phone number to him when he was with Dudu? And the answer was absolutely. So it is conceivable that being with a pet improves a man's sex appeal. So maybe that's an evolution why people could have pets. And another reason, another possibility, is that pets are good for our health. And I'm sure you've seen these, I'm sure you've seen these, I'm sure you've seen these articles in the paper that pets are good for us. And indeed, there are published studies, empirical studies, and some good studies which show that people, that pet owners, uh, have some health advantages, that pet owners are, more like, are less, more likely to survive from heart attacks, that they're, more, they're less likely to be depressed, they're less likely to be lonely, um, they have uh, better psychological well-being, they low, have lower levels of depression, they're less likely to be obese, they get more exercise, and so on and so forth. I'm sure you've seen these stories. Now, I've been studying human-animal interactions for 30 years, and for most of those 30 years, I believed this. I believed that humans were hardwired, instinctive animal lovers. And this was an aspect of human nature that had evolved because it was an adaptation. As I wrote my book on human-animal interactions, I began looking at other literature which made me doubt this idea. And so what I want to do is sort of talk about why I no longer believe that humans are instinctive animal lovers. And let's take the... Uh, idea that pets are, uh, thank you, let's take the idea that pets are good for us. Um, what I have in my office is a file drawer full of scientific articles which, which show that, yeah, pet owners are better off than non-pet owners. But I also have a file drawer with the same number of papers, more papers, which show that there's no difference between pet owners and their health than non-pet owners, and then other papers which show pet owners are worse off. So, for example, there are studies, published studies, peer-reviewed studies, which show that pet owners are more likely to die after a heart attack, that they're more likely to be depressed, that they're more likely to be lonely, that they're more likely to have ulcers, that they're more likely to be obese. And you never read about these studies in the newspaper, because who wants to hear that pets are not good for you? Nobody wants to hear that. I once told, I once told that to a, to, a, uh, to a literary agent. Oh, I want to write a book and say dolphin therapy doesn't work. And she said, like, nobody wants to hear about that. Furthermore, there's no evidence, there's no evidence that pet owners live longer than non-pet owners, so I'm skeptical about that. Another reason has to do with the enormous cultural variation that we see in pet ownership. So for example, I have a colleague that's a member of the Kiambu tribe in Kenya, and I talked with him one day about pets in his culture. 
And he said, yeah, we have dogs. We have mean, vicious dogs, and that's what we like because they, they'll scare away strangers and they'll scare away animals. I said, would you ever let a dog in your house? He said, no. I said, would you ever, like, feed your dog at the table? He said, no. I said, would you ever let a dog, now, would you ever let a dog sleep in your bed? And the look of disgust on his face was just palpable. It's like, if I said to you, hey, I just caught this really nice rat down at the uh, Toronto Riverfront. Would you guys want to sleep with it tonight? That's how he reacted. And it turns out that the, this, this form of dealing with animals is more common than we think. So, for example, anthropologists did a study in which they looked at, compared, compared a study of 60 human cultures, and they looked at the role of dogs in these cultures. And what they found was that dogs were in all these cultures, but they had jobs, they had functions, they worked, they hunted, they herded. They were biological garbage disposals. Of these 60 cultures, and only three, three of the cultures, yeah, that's three, well, only three of the cultures were dogs treated in any way like we treated them. That they were petted, that they were invited into the house, that they were treated as family members. We are the exception rather than the rule. Now, our exception, like Coca-Cola and McDonald's, is spreading across the world. But historically, this has not been the case. Finally, there are massive historical shifts and the way that we think about animals. The animals that love, the animals, we, the animals we love and the animals we hate. So for example, cats. In ancient Egypt, cats were deities. You know, you got buried with your cat, and there was actually a burial industry of cats in, in ancient Egypt. However, by the Middle Ages in Europe, things had completely changed. The Catholic Church declared war on cats. They were thought as being agents of the devil. And if you had a pet cat, you, were, you, could, you could be burned at the stake. Millions of cats were tortured and killed in an attempt to eliminate cats. However, by the middle of the 18th century, the image of cats had been rehabilitated. We brought them into our homes, and they were images of domesticity. So, what I suggest is that biological evolution, biological ideas in which we are instinctive pet lovers, cannot explain why a dog can be so beloved in Kansas and can be put on the barbecue for dinner in Korea why there was a sudden demand for giant beetles in Japan as pets for kids, and why in Amazonia this girl is in love with her pet frog. So I'm suggesting a different explanation is required for, for why we bring pets into our lives. And what I am arguing is that pet keeping requires cultural evolution which is relatively recent in, the human, in human evolutionary history. And I'm stealing ideas from a uh, name that was mentioned yesterday, Richard Dawkins, great evolutionary biologist. And Dawkins argued uh, that cultural evolution, that somewhere between 40 and 100,000 years ago, evolution changed. And the most important aspect of evolution in our lives is not genetic evolution, it's cultural evolution in the form of what he called memes. Now, whether memes really exist or not is irrelevant to my conversation, but he called memes ideas, behaviors, or styles that spread from person throughout a culture. So, for example, a fashion can be a meme. Wearing a baseball hat backwards can be a meme. A tune can be a meme spread throughout a culture. I never imagined that I would want to eat raw fish. And yesterday for lunch, you know what I had? I ate a duck foot for lunch. What kind of culture do people eat? duck feet for lunch. By the way, it wasn't very good. I would not recommend duck feet. <laughs> um, tattoos are memes. And, we, and, our, and, 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 our, and our culture is littered with trendy, pet, trendy pets that come and go. For example, miniature pigs and even pet rocks. Now, can we study the transmission of these metaphorical memes across culture? And the answer is yes. And what my colleagues and I have been doing has been using a theme in this conference, big data, to look at how cultural evolution occurs in our love for animals. And I was incredibly fortunate in that the American Kennel Club at one point gave me a data set which included 60 million dogs. If you're in the United States and if you have a dog that's registered with the American Kennel Club, I've got your dog represented on my computer. So my sample size is 60 million. Now, what I was able to do is to, create, is to recruit some people much smarter than me that, were that, that, that study molecular evolution to apply their mathematical tools to changes in our pre cultural preferences for pets. And a, this is a few of the things that we found. Um, our preferences for pets are constantly shifting. And this, this, graph, uh, this graph shows this. What we find, what we find is that um, there's a constant turnover in fashionable pets. So for example, in the top, in the top uh, 
40 pets, the top 20 pets in the United States, there's a changeover of about two breeds every two years. So there's constant flow. More importantly, what we find is that there is a, pets can go viral. So for example, Irish setters are a good example, just like a YouTube viral. They were, they were chugging along at a you know, pretty low rate of popularity until about, 19, uh, about 1963, in which for no reason at all, they suddenly took off and went from 1,000 registrations a year to 70,000 registrations a year. And this boom and bust pattern in Irish setters is pretty common. It took, and not pretty common in some breeds, and it takes about 25 years from the top of the boom to the bust. And there's other phenomena that occur, and these same phenomena occur in things like baby names. There's a tipping point, just like there is, this is a social epidemic, which is very much like a biological epidemic. Um, and we found that dog breeds follow what's called the logic of fashion cycles. If a dog breed gets popular fast, it crashes fast. If a dog breed gets popular slow, it crashes slow, just like other forms of fashion. And we also found that there's a Disney effect. So for example, we found that after the, mo after the movie The Shaggy Dog came out, that registrations for Old English sheepdogs increased 10,000% in about a decade extraordinary and crashed just as fast. But recently we've been looking at, I think, a more, a more interesting problem. And it's the, it's the problem of whether or not, whoops. It's, well, it's the problem of whether things get, the better things get more popular. And the question here is, are dogs, are dog breeds like iPhones that got popular because they're really good at what they do? Or are they more like hula hoops back in the 1950s that got popular simply because they were popular and other people did it. And what we were able to do was we were able to test this hypothesis by looking at 60 dog breeds and we had an indices of owner complaints about their behaviors. And we were able to ask the question, did dogs that have better behaviors get more popular and the dogs that have fewer genetic diseases get popular. And so, for example, compare chihuahuas and poodles. What you see is if you look at chihuahuas, and if you have small dogs, small dogs have problems. I don't know if yours do, but small dogs tend to have problems. They, uh, for example, chihuahuas are good examples. They tend to uh, get in fights with other dogs. They tend to bite their owners. They're, they're fearful. They're neurotic. They're, uh, they're low trainability, interestingly enough. On the other hand, poodles have low, low frequencies of those obnoxious traits, and they're pretty good at trainability, which is good. So was there a relationship between quality and popularity? The answer was no, absolutely not. None of the behaviors that we looked at was correlated with dog popularity. There was a correlation between health, but what we found was that the, healthier, the, the dogs that were most popular had more genetic problems than dogs that were unpopular. So this raises the question, can really dumb ideas and pets become popular? And we have an example of that um, in the English Bulldog. So if anybody has an English Bulldog, I feel sorry for you. Uh, your life, it consists of dental problems, sleep, snoring. You become your veterinarian's best friend because you're going to send these kids to college. They fart a lot, they snore, and they suddenly drop over dead. You would think that they were becoming less popular. In reality, they were becoming more popular. They're now the most, fourth most popular breed in the United States. So there's other problems with pets as fashion statements. For example, we've got this selective, we've got this selective breeding for deformities. We now have genetically engineered fish that glow in the dark. I don't know what's morally wrong with that, but it gives me the creeps. But I do know there's something morally wrong with the pet fat in China, which is encasing small animals like turtles in plastic where they cannot be fed and using them as forms of jewelry. So back to the question really quickly of why animals keep pets and humans don't. What I'm arguing is that pet keeping requires a suite of characteristics, some of which animals have. Chimpanzees have some of these things. They have parental instincts. They can become attached to other species. We know that. They have empathy, but what they don't have is the ability to imitate that humans have. They don't have the degree of rapid cultural evolution that I think is a requirement of pet keeping. So I'm a human exceptionalist when it comes to this. One psychologist have argued, every psychologist takes a, takes a pen to paper, someday writes a sentence that says, that since humans are the only animal that, and I say keep pets. And I want to close by one thing. My little field of the academic world is called anthozoology. And it's important for a number of reasons. First of all, pet animals occupy almost every aspect of human life. The animals we eat, the animals we love, the animals hate, they occur in art, they occur in religion, they occur in music, everything. 
And we're just starting to study this. And I think the reason that I do this is because when we study our relationships with animals, we are really learning about ourselves. Thank you.